Hello, and welcome to MIT Sloan Alumni Online. Every month, MIT Sloan Alumni Online brings you the latest breaking news, cutting-edge research, groundbreaking ideas, and school updates from MIT Sloan faculty and alumni. Today, we are pleased to have Paul Hellman joining us. Paul is an author, a speaker, and consultant whose work has been featured in numerous publications, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and the Boston Globe. He is the author of three books whose titles are up on your screen. Paul consults and speaks internationally, advising thousands of executives and professionals during his career at organizations like Aetna, Boeing, NASA, State Street, and many more. He has also led a workshop here on campus during the Sloan Innovation Period for the past five years, and we're very grateful for that. Paul is a graduate from the MIT Sloan School of Management, class of 1981. He also holds undergraduate and graduate degrees in psychology from Clark University and the University of West Georgia. We are so pleased to have him with us today, live from the MIT Sloan campus. Paul, thanks for joining us today. And to give our audience a sense of the format for today's session, we'll start with a presentation by Paul, then follow with a question and answer session. As a reminder to our viewers, you may type in your questions at any time using the Q&A panel and the Zoom interface. Paul, I will now turn it over to you. Thank you, Greg. I was on an airplane recently, and an extraordinary thing happened, and you've all experienced this, which is we all got into our seats, and we fastened the seatbelt, and then they closed the airplane doors, and then the flight attendants stood up to review the safety information. And they said amazing, they had amazing information to which we had absolutely zero interest. So they were saying things like, your seat cushion could be used as a flotation device. And our attitude was, fine. There could be oxygen masks coming from the ceiling. All right. They may or may not inflate. Whatever. I'm going to call this style of communication airplane mode. And I'm going to argue that more often than not, you and I are in airplane mode. So airplane mode means, hey, I said it. And maybe you heard it, and that's great. And maybe you didn't, and that's too bad. What you already know as a leader is, yes, it's important what you say. But even more important is, what do people hear? And then from that portion that they heard, what are they actually going to remember? And from that portion they heard and remembered, what are they actually going to do? And so that's what we're up to today. How can you and I break through this thing called airplane mode so that every time you speak, you get heard, you get remembered, and you get results? Now, here's the main problem. And it's one that you all know about. If I were to say, do you think attention spans are getting larger or smaller? You wouldn't hesitate to say, obviously, they are getting smaller. Microsoft has done some research which indicates the average attention span is now eight seconds, which is why I titled my last book, You've Got Eight Seconds. What's really kind of depressing about this is that goldfish are reported to have a nine second attention span. So goldfish are beating us. And now we know all the reasons why attention spans keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But I'm gonna throw in one more reason. And this is one of my favorite questions. And the question is, how many thoughts a day do you actually think you have? I'm gonna ask you to jot down a number. And let me qualify this, because I'm not asking you, I'm not asking you how many clever thoughts, how many original thoughts, how many, I'm not even asking how many different thoughts. Just how many of those little thought bubbles do you have? Like, you know, right now you could be thinking, I like this, I don't like this, am I really gonna stick this out for the whole hour? Should I, what about this email? I have to say all these things. How many of those thoughts do you think go through your head in 24 hours? The only time I ever heard anybody put a number on this was years ago, I went to a a lecture given by a very well-known physician author, Deepak Chopra, and he claimed that you and I have in the order of 60,000 thoughts per day. So I don't know how he arrived at that. We'll take that with kind of a grain of salt. 
But if you do the math, it's about a thought every second or two. Here's what that means. Every time you speak, and by speak, yeah, you could be giving a presentation, but you could also just be, you could be talking to your manager, you could be, you could be at a meeting, you're not even leaving the meeting, you're just raising your hand to say something. You could be on a global conference call. Every time you speak, you are speaking into a listening. This is an odd way of putting it, but you're speaking into a listening that is cluttered with 60,000 thoughts. So another way of framing up what we're, what we're talking about here is how do you break through flight attendant mode? How do you break through the clutter of, of all that noise? How can you get heard in a noisy world? Here's one of my favorite quotes about leadership. Every time you speak, and again, think about all the times you speak in the course of a day, formal, informal, large group, small group, it doesn't matter. Even all the emails that you send, I would put them in this box too. Every time you speak, you are auditioning for leadership. This comes from James Humes. James Humes was a former presidential speechwriter to four different US presidents. So think about what that means. Every time you speak, it's an audition. And what I think James Humes is telling us is that people, yeah, people may or may not remember exactly what you said. They may not remember anything you said, but here's what they'll remember. They will remember their impression of you. And impression after impression after impression adds up, add up, and can really make or break your career. So all these moments, they may seem like small moments, they're not so small. So, okay, how are we going to, in an eight second world where every time you speak, on the one hand, you're auditioning for leadership, so kind of the stakes can be high, but on the other hand, you're speaking into this listening that's cluttered with 60,000 thoughts. What do we do about all that? And I'm gonna give you three words, and I'm gonna keep circling back again and again to these three words. And the three words are B, the audience. And the audience, again, could, you could be speaking to a thousand people, you could just be speaking to one person. But this to me is a really, really important point. And people will tell you, of course, all the time, you should know the audience and absolutely good common sense there. Be the audience is a little bit different. I'm gonna give you a couple of quick examples of what I mean. And then we're gonna spend some time really operationalizing these three words into some very, I think, practical, usable tactics. So a couple of quick examples. I was working with a, a mid-career engineer and he was getting ready for his end of year performance review. And he wanted to strategize, what should I say to my boss? And so we're, we're talking about that. And I asked him a question that I'm gonna be getting us to later on in this, in this webinar. And the question is a very simple one, but it's a, it actually usually gives people pause and you have to really kind of think about the answer. And the question was, at the end of your mid-year performance review with your boss, what is it that you want her to remember? She could only remember one thing. What's the thing? Well, he didn't pause. He said, I want her to know that I am very, very, very unhappy here. Huh. Okay. Now let's go back to be the audience. So what I mean by that in this case is before you go knocking on your boss's door to tell her how unhappy you are, let's be the boss. So imagine now you're not you, you're the boss. Here comes one of your employees, end of your review to tell you how unhappy he is. How are you likely as the boss to react to that? What are you likely to think? What are you likely to feel? Now, of course, you and I right now, we're just speculating, but it's worth speculating. It could be that the boss gets defensive and thinks, oh, I guess what you're really saying is, I'm not a very good boss, because if I were a good boss, you wouldn't be so miserable. Or it could be that the boss hears this as just, oh my God, I've got one more problem on a huge list of problems. Or it could be that the boss gets kind of annoyed and thinks, you know what? I'll bet I could post your job and within a couple of weeks, I might get, well, I don't know, several hundred resumes from people who would not be very, very, very unhappy. 
Now, what this person really wanted to say, as we kind of worked on the message, was how can I get more responsibility? And that's a totally different framing. So if this person were to walk in for the end of your review and say something like, you know, I've been thinking about how I can, I can really make a bigger contribution to, to our team, to our group, to this organization, and maybe even take some burden off of your shoulders. And I'm hoping at some point during this review, we can talk about that. What do you think? That's a whole different approach. So that's an example of what I mean by be the audience. I'll give you a couple of more examples. Let's say you are, you're leaving somebody a voicemail. Be the audience means pay a lot of attention to their outgoing message. For one thing, what's the speed of the message? So if somebody is talking really fast, guess what? You probably want to speed up the message that you're about to leave. If someone says, hi, this is Bob, leave a message, you know, you got to be really short and to the point. If someone says, this is Samantha and I'm currently in the Arctic being pursued by wolverines. Well, you might want to say, ah, sounds like you're having an interesting day. That's a lot like our office. So this is all about adapting. If I get an email this afternoon, I get emails like this, but not that often. And the email says, dear Paul, guess what? I'm probably going to answer back, dear, whatever this person's name is. So be the audience has a lot of different applications. Part of being the audience, an important part, is to think about, is to think through this question. What is, what is the right amount of detail? And what I'm always telling people is detail is like salt, meaning you can always add more, but once it's in, you cannot take it out. And I have to tell you, I get called Oh, maybe once every month or two by a senior executive from a client company. It's always a different person, but it's always the same phone call. And the phone call goes kind of like this. The senior executive will say, I have somebody that works for me that is just smart as smart can be. They're brilliant. But, but I cannot let this person anywhere near my boss, and I absolutely can't let them anywhere near my boss's boss. So I always act like I've never heard this conversation before, and I say, how come? And they say, well, this person will want to tell you everything about everything, and my boss has no tolerance for that. So because of the business that I'm in, I'm somebody that loves watching, I love watching uh, politics and political debates, and I want to just give you an example about the right amount of detail. This is not part of some, because this happened during the last presidential election on both, re, on both the Democratic side and the Republic, Republican side. And what happened is, I want you to imagine that you're running for president and you're still, in the, you're still running for your party's nomination and it's early in the season. And on the Democrat side, there were a lot of people up on the stage and some of them were not well known to the audience. So typically what happens in these debates is you're given maybe a minute or two minutes to make an introductory remark. And I'm watching the senator that I was very unfamiliar with. And he starts by saying, I'm married and my wife and I have six children, five girls, one boy. And I'm thinking, wow, <laughs> we can, my wife and I have two kids. And I'm thinking that, that's pretty amazing. But then he makes an interesting tactical choice. He decides he's going to tell us in his, again, one to two minute opening, he's going to give us the names of each of the children and tell us what each one does. So he starts with the daughters and he goes, daughter number one, her name is this, she does that, daughter number two and so forth. And then, then there's this pause. And I had actually taped this, so I, I, I rewound the tape to watch it again. There was like a few second pause. And it was as if, was as if he had completely gone blank on daughter number three. Who is that? And, you know, again, as somebody that has two kids, there is some point, I'm not sure how many, how many kids it takes, but there is some point where you, your brain just goes completely mush. And I think maybe that's what happened. Anyway, after a few second pause, he goes, Julia, massage therapist. And then on he went. On the, on the other side, on the Republican side, one of the candidates in his opening remarks said, I'm going to eliminate five different departments. And then he decided he was going to name them. 
the only problem is he named the Commerce Department twice. And I'm thinking, yeah, so as if he's saying, I mean, any idiot can eliminate the Commerce Department, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get rid of it, and then I'm gonna get rid of it all over again. So you have to think about what is the right amount of detail. And what I believe is you can err on either side. You can give too little, that can be a mistake, or you can give too much. And there are times when either one of those mistakes can get you into trouble. But let's say that, let's say tomorrow, you have to give a, an update to the CEO of your organization. Which mistake is gonna be more costly? So let's play it out. If you walk into the CEO's office and you give, let's say, just the headline news, what's gonna happen next? If the CEO has questions, he or she is then gonna pepper you with more detail. And now you're, by the way, in conversational mode, which is always a better mode to be in anyway. On the other hand, you walk into the CEO's office and you're the person that says everything about everything, there's a good chance you will not be invited back. There's a name for this phenomenon. It's called the curse of knowledge. It's a great phrase. The curse, and the curse of knowledge really plagues each one of us. And it says, the more you know about something, the more you know about something, the worse you are at explaining it. So what is the right amount of detail? We're talking about be the audience. What is the right amount of detail that they would need? We're talking, another way of saying all this is that you and I need to focus your me the message. And now what we're gonna look at, again, operationalizing be the audience, we're gonna look at how can you focus any message? And I'm saying any message. This could be a presentation all the way down to an email. How do you focus a message? Well, I believe and this is a methodology that I use all the time, and I use this in workshops, and I use this in keynote speeches, and I use this when I consult to senior leadership groups or when I consult to executives who have an important message or an important presentation. I believe every audience in the world has three questions. And this, by the way, not just at work, but also at home. So if you go home tonight and you're talking to your roommate or you're talking to your significant other, he or she, if you start talking about your day, they will have these same three questions. And when I work with people around presentations and someone says, I have a presentation, I say, well, how do you know? And they'll say, are you kidding? I have, I have got 125 PowerPoint slides. And my reaction is, well, that's an impressive deck, but you don't have a presentation, I don't think, unless you've answered these three questions. So let's take a look. The first question is, why am I listening to you? Now granted, most people are polite, and they're never actually gonna verbalize this, but this is the listening that you're speaking into. Why am I listening to you? I have 60,000 thoughts of my own. And by the way, we haven't really talked about what those thoughts are about, so let's do a quick digression. Clearly, some of them are just random, free associative. Um, it's also obvious, don't you think, that at least 20,000, at least 20,000 of the thoughts are obviously about food. What have I eaten? When will I eat again? Why is, why is there never anything good in the refrigerator? I feel like I'm gaining a little weight. Can you recommend a good diet? You know, my wife told me when I was trying to come up with a title for um, the last book, You've Got Eight Seconds, she said, you know, if you really want this thing yourself, you should really, it should really be the eight second diet. That book would just fly off the shelves. So, 20,000 thoughts about food, but what about the other 40? What about the, you know, we're so busy thinking all day long that we hardly ever pause to think about, what am I thinking about? If you take a close look, I think what you might discover is that a lot of those 60,000 thoughts in one way or another revolve around you. Meaning that when you and I wake up in the morning, we, we wake up into the ongoing story of us. So you are in the dramatic story of you where the central character is you. And I have shown up right now as a very, very minor bit player in your ongoing story, which is I'm on this webinar and blah, 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 blah. So the first question, think of these questions, by the way, as hurdles. The first question that people have, the first hurdle that you and I need to jump over is, why am I listening? The second hurdle or the second question is, 
okay, I'm listening. What are you saying? You know, I do, I do a, a workshop on stories, stories for, for business audiences. How do you craft a story? And by the way, as a leader, stories are really, that's a really important tool to have. And have you ever heard a story that goes like this? Someone will say, last Thursday, no, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, it couldn't have been Thursday because Thursday I was in Cincinnati, you know, it's like the craziest thing. Wednesday night, they say, you're flying to Cincinnati. And I'm thinking, what, I have no life? I can just pack up a toothbrush and I gotta go to Cincinnati? So it couldn't have been Thursday. Maybe it was Tuesday. And as the audience, you're thinking, I, I don't really care whether it was Tuesday, Wednesday, who cares? Cincinnati, New York, what happened? So we have to, we have to uh, jump over this hurdle and get clear about what we're saying. The final question every audience has is first, you know, why am I listening? Second, what are you saying? And the third one is, what, what do you want me to do about this? Every single person that I work with is time stressed. Nobody has enough time. And if you ask people, well, where does your time go? It goes into to emails, meetings, and miscellaneous. And think about all the meetings that you go to where there is no decision or action. These are just, I wanted to give you a quick update. This is just FYI. And, and most of my clients tend to be large global organizations and it is useful. It is useful for one hand to know what the other hand is doing. So there is a role for FYI informational meetings. But if your calendar is just chock full of no, there's nothing really that you need to do, nothing you need to do, then at some point you have to ask, am I really using my time the smartest way possible? All right, those are the three questions. And for each of those questions, what we're gonna look at now is a tool for finessing the question, for jumping the hurdle that the, that the question presents. So remember, the first question was why listen? And the tool here, and again, this is for a presentation, this is for a meeting, this is for a phone conversation, the tool here is to give people a purpose statement. I've already given you a couple of purpose statements and I'll go over a few of them in a second. A purpose statement is designed to answer this question, why am I listening? So a purpose statement is not an agenda. An agenda is usually a list and an agenda is fine. I'm a big fan of agendas. Almost every speaker that I work with will have an agenda. That's great. Although I have to tell you in terms of PowerPoint slides, I'm not a fan of, of more than three or four bullets on a slide. So if you have an agenda with a huge list, not particularly useful, I don't think, because no one's going to remember it. But a purpose statement is not an agenda. An agenda is the what. Here's what we're going to talk about. A purpose statement is the why. And here's what makes it a little bit tricky, it's from the audience point of view. A purpose statement is from the audience point of view. I'm gonna give you, here's an example. Let's suppose that your organization asks you to do some recruiting next spring and you're gonna to go to some college campuses and you're gonna meet with graduating seniors. And maybe you'll have a day where, of one-to-one -one meetings, but before that there'll be, you're gonna host a reception you're gonna host a reception and you're gonna to speak to 20, 30 people. You're gonna stand up and say something about your organization. What is your purpose statement? Now I've actually, I've actually used this exercise in workshops and invariably people will say, will raise their hand and they'll say, well, I'm gonna tell, I wanna start by saying, our pur my purpose is to tell you that our organization is a great place to work. Now, let's go back. What is, what's the point that I keep driving here over and over and over again? It is, in three words, be the audience. Okay, let's be the audience. So now you have to imagine, you have to go back and imagine, okay, I'm in my early 20s, I'm graduating from college. What are my concerns? Again, be the audience means imagine, put yourself in the other person's place, stress test your message against their probable listening. Well, if you're a graduating college, you've got a lot of concerns about paying off your student loans, finding a job, any job to pay the rent, get out of your parents' house, and so forth. 
but we don't need to make this overly complicated. Can we say that you want, you want an organization, you want to work for an organization in a job that is going to fit you. And if we just leave it at that, then the opening, if, you, if you're in the scenario where you're speaking to, again, the, at a reception, your opening could be, you are, you could, this is the words that I would use, you're probably wondering, and by the way, there are at least 10 ways to open a talk, and this is one of them called, you're probably wondering, or you may be thinking, or you may be feeling. So if I were doing this, I would go, you're probably wondering, would our organization be a good fit for you? Our purpose today is to help you figure that out. And do you see how that's different than starting with, well, we're the greatest ever organization and blah, 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 blah. This is, this is a purpose statement. Purpose statement is not agenda and it's from the audience point of view. It's the value that they're going to get. It's kind of like, tell them what they've won, Bob. What are they going to get by listening? Okay, so that is, that's the first tool. And then uh, the question that I get with that is, hey, wait a minute, you're saying a purpose statement is a benefit. What if there is no benefit? I remember working with a woman, she headed up the, the regulatory department at a big jam company. And she said, everybody hates me at the company because every time I walk in the room, I'm there to tell them the newest regulations and all the things that they were able to do, but now they can't do. And she said, I need to tell them about the regulations, but there's really no benefit. And so what I suggested, I said, here's a trick, and it's only gonna work one time for an audience, for any given audience. But the next time you have to talk about the regulations, start with a PowerPoint slide that has no words on them, and it should look like this and point to this prison and say, our purpose today is to avoid going there. So a purpose statement can either be, here's the good thing you're gonna get, or here's the bad thing that you will avoid. That's a purpose statement. Okay, question number two after why am I listening is, what exactly are you saying? Now this is a picture of course of Winston Churchill, and we'll get to him in a second. But I remember, when our son graduated college, the commencement speaker was the former governor of Massachusetts. And I remember being very excited about this because the governor had a very well-deserved reputation for being just an excellent communicator. And my son was excited and his friends were excited. It was a big audience that day. Anyway, the, the former governor stands up and I'll never forget his first line. He said, looked at this crowd and he said, none of you, none of you, are going to remember a single word I'm about to say. Hmm. I had two reactions. My, my first reaction was, wow, the governor totally gets college because, you know, you take 30 courses, 40 courses, and you cram, 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 and then the day after the final, you don't remember anything. So, yay on that. But my second reaction was, wait a minute, if we're not going to remember anything, why are we listening? Now, if he had just changed that an inch, he almost could have used the exact same words. He, what he could have said was, none of you are gonna remember a single thing I'm about to tell you, except for one thing. See how that changes the chemistry? And we'll get to that one thing in a little bit. Now you're kind of on the edge of your chair going, gee, what's the one thing? What's the one thing? What's the one thing? Back to Winston Churchill, 1941, two years into World War II, Winston Churchill's reported to have given the following commencement address. So let's be the audience again. Imagine you're the audience. You've got Winston Churchill coming to speak at your graduation. This has got to be just thrilling. Winston Churchill shows up, he stands up, he looks at the audience and he says, never give in, never give in, never, never, never. Thank you. And that was it. Well, that's at least the reported story. So I put that anecdote in my eight second book and if you put something in a book, you got to double check it, triple check it. And it turns out the actual version is a little bit different. Winston Churchill gave a 740 word speech that day. But if you do the math, 740 words, you are still in and out of that room in under five minutes. And I think the reason 
this folklore about never give in, never give in, never, never, never. I'm sure he said that. And that was the most important thing. And that was the thing that everybody remembered. And Winston Churchill designed the thing that way. So what are you saying? What is your main message? Now, what we're looking at here, this is actually a, we're looking at my front yard. Uh, and this is a tree in the front yard. And the reason I'm showing you this tree is to make the point that when you have a, a lengthy message, you want to think of it like a tree. So your main message is the trunk of the tree. And then your key points are the branches that come off of the tree. And then, of course, branches can have other some smaller branches and all the way to twigs. And this is the way you build out a message. But it's important to know what's the trunk, what are the key points, because here's, here's something that either has happened to you or absolutely will happen to you. At some point, somebody very senior in your organization is going to say they want you to give a, let's say, a 20 minute talk to the board or some other very senior group. And you're going to really spend a lot of time putting together a, a presentation. Maybe it's a PowerPoint presentation. And you're going to show up and be waiting outside the conference room the day of that presentation. And suddenly the door is going to open. And your host is going to come out. And he or she is going to apologize. And they're going to say, yeah, uh, I know we said 20 minutes, but we're really running over. Sorry, you're going to need to do it in five. And if all you've got is the deck, and you haven't prioritized, you haven't figured out what's the hierarchy of my information, which is what you get when you split out the main message from the key points, you're in some trouble. But if you've done the work of figuring out, okay, what's the most important thing, you are in better shape. Let's go back to food. We haven't talked about that for a while. This is what we're looking at here is, is food, lettuce. Uh, but what I really want to show you is Michael Pollan, the author of a, of a very good book on nutrition called In Defense of Food. It's a good book, although I have to tell you I've never read it. And the reason I've never read it is that I heard Michael Pollan, when he was promoting the book, talk about it. And he said, here are the three key things. I, we never got, I never got the main message, but I did get the three key points. And the three key points, you can, you can see them on that lettuce, which is eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And then the book really drills, I, I'm told, just drills down on those three things. So, by the way, if 20,000 thoughts are about food, and I'm dead serious here, you should talk, if you can, about food. And I want to give you, I'm going to give you, and by the way, three, in terms of key points, three is a very good number. Not 10, not 15, three. I'm going to give you three examples of how people have talked about food. So there's a, uh, years ago, there was a very famous, uh, there was a very famous memo at Yahoo called the Peanut Butter Manifesto. You can Google this. The Peanut Butter Manifesto was basically a complaint internal at Yahoo that Yahoo was spreading their resources too thinly, kind of like peanut butter on bread. Second example, is something called the sandwich technique, which is a discredited HR technique for giving feedback, where if you have to give somebody a negative message, you sandwich it in between something positive and then at the beginning and something positive at the end. So it would sound like, Alfred, you're doing a great job. It's true that last report was late and it was riddled with errors and I suspect mostly plagiarized, but keep up the good work. So that is the discredited sandwich technique. And then the third example of food, one of my favorites, is the Swiss cheese method, which comes courtesy of Alan Lakian, who was one of the early time management gurus. And he had some very interesting, I think very practical advice. If you find yourself procrastinating or avoiding a project, the Swiss cheese method was give yourself a very, very short amount of time, like five minutes. I'm just going to spend five minutes on this project. That's it, five minutes. And in five minutes, you poke a few holes in it, like Swiss cheese. And then lo and behold, often what happens is you've got some momentum and you can keep going. So if you can find a way to talk about food in a presentation through an analogy or whatever, useful to do. 
Okay, we're looking at three questions and three techniques. So far, question number one was, why am I listening? The technique here was a purpose statement. Question number two is, what are you saying? The technique was to have a main message and then develop it with key points. And the third question was, what should I do? And the technique here is to give people a call to action. If you've ever done anything in sales, you will be familiar with the idea of a call to action, but I'm gonna put a twist on this and suggest that a call to action can be not just what do you want people to do, but alternatively, what do you want people to feel or what do you want people to think? So when I work with people on a call to action, I start always with what's the next step? What do you want people to do? But occasionally I'll have pushback. You say, well, there really isn't anything I want people to do. Then I go to, okay, then what do you want people to feel? And the close, the call to action would sound like, so I hope something, I'll give you a couple of examples. So I hope you feel as excited about our future going forward as I do. Or I, if you're talking to customers, I, I, I hope you feel confident about our absolute commitment to doing the very best with your account that we can do. So those are, those are examples of feel. A think call to action would be to circle back on your main message and say, if you can only remember one thing, here's the thing I want you to remember. So now we're just talking call to action is a thing. I wanna circle back to my main message, which is be the audience, be the audience, be the audience. And here's that tree again with the main message versus the three key points. So if I had three key points, they would look like this. To get heard, you need a purpose statement. To get remembered, you need a main message. And finally, to get results, you need a call to action. But the spirit of be the audience is more important than any particular technique. And what I mean by that is, I believe it's always a mistake to use techniques in a robotic way. So for example, let's say you're a manager and you have a weekly staff meeting. Do you always need to start with a purpose statement, I would I would argue probably you don't, probably you don't. And if you if you if you always start with the purpose statement and you see people are yawning or whatever, rolling their eyes, then you know, well I've I've violated the spirit, which is be the audience, be the audience, be the audience. One of my clients is the chief investment officer at a global money management firm, and. Uh, he's on the uh, he's the chief investment officer on the fixed income side of the house, and so every every morning he has he holds a meeting. And if you go to the and I've I've gone to this meeting, and if you go to the meeting, you'll you'll see about there'll be about thirty people in the room, and some are traders, and some are bond analysts, and then there are other people that are being video conferenced in. And let's say you're a bond analyst sitting at this morning meeting. And you're an analyst, so you've done a lot of research on, on a particular or on a set of bonds. You know a lot. But if you ask the chief investment officer what he wants you to say, here's what he'll tell you. A good presentation, and by the way, he's the exact opposite of the person that's photographed. He would say, a good presentation, give me your conclusion. Tell me how you got there, and then give me your conclusion again. That's a good presentation. Notice that that does not line up exactly with purpose, main message, call to action, but it very much lines up with be the audience because if he is your audience, this is what you want to do. Okay, what's the next step? So what's my call to action? I wanna go back to the idea of details like salt, and I'm gonna suggest in a minute something that I call the 60, 30, 15 drill. But the main thing that I would have you do is practice, practice, practice. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, all the great speakers, all the great speakers started out as bad speakers. And how did they go from bad to better and from better to good and from good to great? They just kept practicing. Now, one thing that you can practice, this, this 60, 30, 15 second drill, 
and it, it plays off of be the audience and it plays off of details like salt. The next time you have a message, and it could even could be a it could be a spoken message, it could even be an email. What is the 60 second version of that message? What's the 30 second version? And what's the short 15 second version? I have to tell you, I've done this drill a lot in workshops. And at the end, and I have people pair up and talk about something in these three lengths. And at the end of that, I'll poll the audience. I'll say, okay, how many people like the 60 second version all the way to 15? Almost invariably, the majority of people in that room will say, I, what I liked, I like the 30 second version. But the question is, be the audience. What does your audience want? Because if you're a technical person talking to a technical audience, they may not even want, they may want the five minute version. So we go back to that. The other next step I need to, oh, by the way, in terms of practice, if anybody happens to be on this call and wants to practice, I will be doing a workshop in Boston Monday and Tuesday on dynamic speaking. So send me an email and I'll send you some information. That's actually, again, next Monday, Tuesday. And then of course I have to shamelessly uh, promote my latest book. You've got eight seconds. This book is three strategies. We've been looking at the first strategy, which is be the audience, which is all about speak with focus. There's a second strategy, which is speak with variety. How can you be slightly different? And slightly is important, an important word, and so is different. How can you be slightly different? Because slightly different captures attention. And the third strategy is how can you speak with presence? Presence is an important word. But the problem is people never define it. So what I've done in this book is to operationalize presence. Here are 10 things that create, that will create and project for other people uh, the sense that you have this thing called presence. Also, I would invite you to check out my website. I, in addition to books, I write very fast tips. I've been writing them for years and years. CNBC has published over 100. And if you would like to try these, no cost, twice a month, just go to my website, put in your email and off we go. Next one will be next week. You know, if you don't like it, there's always in every tip a unsubscribe, you're off the list immediately forever. And I always promise to remain cheerful. Okay, good. So we have time for questions, Greg? We do. Thank you, Paul. Uh, as a reminder to our viewers, you may type your questions for Paul into the Q&A panel on the Zoom interface. And while you're doing that, I'd like to take a moment to tell you about some upcoming MIT Sloan Alumni Online events. On October 25th, alumnus Brad Feld will discuss Give First, a new approach to entrepreneurship and mentorship based on his upcoming book and current work with Foundry Group and Techstars. Also on November 14th, we will hear from MIT Sloan School of Management faculty member Tavneet Suri, who is the Lewis E. Saley Professor of Applied Economics. Her expertise is in development economics, specializing in sub-Saharan Africa. We're looking forward to having them both join us this fall. You can learn more about these sessions and register by visiting the MIT Sloan Alumni Online website. And now our first question for Paul. Um, if you had to ask many people about their greatest fears, uh, you'll often hear that public speaking rises to the top of that list. So, Paul, what tips or advice would you have for our audience in overcoming those nerves, the jitters that they may feel going into a presentation? Yeah, and that question comes up all the time. So I want to say a couple of things about that. And because we also got a lot, Greg, we got a lot of questions in advance about that same thing. First thing is that fear or anxiety or jitters, none of those things have your name on them. They are part of the space that you occupy when you stand up in front of other people. And it's really, really useful to know that I would say at least 95% of people that speak have some form of anxiety or jitters. What's also really useful to know is that you can, and this comes as a, as a surprise to a lot of people, you can look confident outside from the outside without feeling confident on the inside. That's important. And so, Usually when, when, like at, this, at the dynamic speaking workshop that I'm going to do next week, we talk about some strategies that you can use internally as well as externally. I'll give you one that, that a lot of people find very helpful, which is mantra. A mantra is a word or a phrase that you tell yourself to evoke a certain quality. So a mantra is a word or a phrase 
you use to evoke a certain quality. So typically what happens when people walk in to, let's say, give a presentation is they have all sorts of um, internal dialogue or self-talk, and a lot of it is very negative. And so if I'm walking in to give a presentation and my internal dialogue is, God, I hate doing this, I'm really bad at this, there's my boss, she thinks I'm an idiot, you know, she's right, I really am an idiot, I don't even know what half of these PowerPoint slides mean. If you're walking in with that, then on some level that may leak or show up in your facial expression, your tone of voice, the way you stand, all of that. But, but if you, on the other hand, come up with a mantra, what is it that you want to project? And you want to play, you want to keep a mantra short and simple, but just to, to kind of uh, bookend one, let's say your mantra was strong and confident. And so now I'm walking into a room and, I'm, and, my, and my mantra is strong, confident, strong, confident, strong, confident. Oh, by the way, here's a tip. You, you really don't want to say that out loud. That's just your internal mantra. If you have, if you walk in with that, and that's that's what's playing in your head, there's a good chance that you will stand up a little straighter. You might speak a little bit louder, which is always a good thing to do. And you might actually look. You might actually look like you are more comfortable than you feel. So there are a lot of tricks like that. But the major trick, and I would say the major, the major cause of anxiety is that people don't practice enough. They either don't practice, they don't practice their specific talk enough, or they just don't practice speaking enough. And so again, we go back to Emerson, practice, practice, practice. Thanks, Paul. I think we've all felt maybe a bit of that imposter syndrome at different points in our lives and careers. And I'd say yes, even small school management along that. So thank you for those tips. Uh, a number of questions have come in regarding handling tough topics uh, in a presentation. So maybe it's you're anticipating walking into a room where you have a hostile audience. Yeah. Um, what strategies or advice would you share with individuals who are preparing for that type of situation? Yeah. Well, I would still use I would still use mantra and other inner techniques like that. But there's something that I like very much, and it comes from improvisational theater, and it's called the law of agreement. So if I'm walking into a hostile audience, what I want to try to do is is and so or somebody raises a, 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 let's say a, a confrontational question or makes a confrontational comment, I want to try to agree with it. I'll give you I'll give you a quick example. I was I was doing a uh, I was hired years ago to do a series of leadership workshops. This was a this was a Fortune 50 company, and uh, they had a new CEO, and the new CEO wanted to completely transform the culture of this organization that had been very top down, command and control, authoritarian, to a more empowered. Uh, take off the handcuffs kind of a place. And so part of the cultural change was we're going to take, we're like 160,000 people in the organization, we're going to take the top 5,000 and we're going to put them through a week-long leadership program. And I was one of the people who led this. The person who hired me said, they're going to hate you. That's what he said before I'm walking. So they're going to hate you. And I said, well, couldn't they just strongly dislike me? Do they have to hate me? I mean, they're going to hate you. Uh, and he said, here's what you should do when that happens. He said, his advice was, be a mirror, be a mirror. And what he meant by that was a mirror just reflects back to the audience. So what happened, I was doing the, the first of these week long workshops and we were maybe an hour in and somebody raised his hand and he said, this is a total waste of time. This, this workshop is a total waste of time. I'm wasting the entire week. I traveled a long distance. It's just a waste of time. Now, my normal reaction would be to argue that and defend the program and advocate for the program and explain all the reasons why the program and all that. But I didn't do any of that. I remembered be a mirror, right? Law of agreement. So law of agreement just says, well, that's an interesting comment. What do the rest of you think? So in other words, a mirror would reflect it back to the room. What do the rest of you think? And it turned out, that the rest of the people in the room had all sorts of different appearance, different different points of view. Some said, yeah, it is a waste of time. Other people said, I don't know if it's a complete waste of time, maybe it's just a partial waste of time. And somebody else said, I, I think we should keep going, which is what we ended up doing. But the law of agreement says, don't, if somebody's coming at you, the worst thing that you want to do is start arguing. What you want to do is kind of yield 
or give them airtime or say, that's an interesting objection, tell me more. So those are examples of what I'm calling law of agreement or what my clients said, be your mirror. Thank you, Paul. And this is somewhat related, but um, do you have specific tips or advice on handling a Q&A session? So this is what we're doing right now, of <laughs> course, but we're getting very meta. But, um, you know, maybe that unanticipated question, or if it catches you off guard as a presenter, tips or strategies for dealing with that? Yeah, you know, one of the, one of the concerns I hear a lot um, from people is what do I do when I get a question and I don't know the answer? Because of course, the first thing you want to do if you have a question, if you got a question, you know the answer is answer it. But it often does happen that people don't know the answer and there are some very, very good techniques. So uh, I'll give you just one or two. One is what I call refer. In a way, this is a variation of be the dear mirror. So somebody asks a question, you don't as a presenter have to pretend to be the smartest person in the room. In fact, in the United States, we have a word for somebody that knows the answer to everything. We have a, we have a word, we call that person a know-it-all, and that is not a compliment. So one thing you can do with a question is, you could say, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I'm wondering what the, what the rest of the room thinks about that. That's refer, so refer the question to other people. Another one is, defer, which means you delay your answer. And so this one I, I like a whole lot. You can't always use it, but sometimes you can say something to the effect of, you know, that's an important question and I really would like to do a little bit of research. Would it be okay if I got back to you and then you, you put out a time in the next 24 hours or the next 48 hours? Almost always the person is gonna say, of course, now, what you've done there is you've said, you've, you've said to the person, I take your question seriously, I'm a serious person, I'm gonna do some homework, and you've also made a promise. And then, if you actually do your homework and you get back to the person as promised, I believe nine times out of 10, you've actually increased your influence, you've increased your reputation. So a big mistake with questions, I think, is thinking that you have to be able to answer every single one. That said, part of your preparation for any presentation is to anticipate, uh, usually what I tell people to do is, what are the most likely questions, of course, but also what are the nightmare questions that you would absolutely dread being asked? And part of your preparation is to, is to, is to get prepped on both of those. Great, thanks Paul. And I think we have time for one more question, so we will close this out. Um, of course, here at Sloan, we have a very broad international community, um, and many of our alumni work for large global organizations, travel extensively. Um, of course, we could spend a whole session talking about cross-cultural communications, but um, maybe you could share a few thoughts on that, communicating effectively across culture. Yeah, so in a way, I think it's such a, it's a great question to close with because it gets us back to what I believe is the central message of this webinar, which is be the audience, be the audience, be the audience. And what that question points to, whether you're, you know, whether you're working in Asia, Europe, or here in the United States, in a way you want to treat every audience with that same carefulness of what is the culture here? Because every organization has a culture. And so it gets us back to be the audience, be the audience, be the audience. On a tactical basis, I just will throw in one thing which is I've worked with an awful lot of people where English was not their native language and are amazingly well-versed in English though. The one thing that, I'm, that I find myself saying a lot is slow down. Um, and I've come to believe that there are many languages, non-English languages that just operate um, at an accelerated pace of English. So, so again, part of what you and I wanna be paying attention to is what is the speed? But that's true even in the United States. If you're on a phone call and people are talking at a mile a minute, you probably want to speed up. And if it's the opposite, you want to slow down, which gets us again to be the audience. Thank you, Paul. And what I love about this topic as a whole is that no matter how well practiced we are uh, in public speaking, we can always improve. So you've given our audience a lot of tips uh, to think about and implement. So we appreciate you being with us here today. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all of our Sloan alumni and friends for joining us. 
To keep this conversation going over social media, you can use the hashtag Sony Chats. Following this event, you will receive a survey via email. Please fill it out and let us know your feedback on this session and our ongoing lineup of events for this fall. As always, you can reach out to us at Sloan Alumni Online at MIT.edu. Thanks for joining us today, and thanks again to Paul.